Hey guys, this is Eden. So today we're going to actually code a neural network from scratch in Python. So I think this is really neat because most people jump right to TensorFlow or Keras or they jump right to some library to do it. And it's really kind of, if you do this first, you'll probably have a better understanding once you start working with libraries of how neural networks actually work at a base level. So just starting off, I'm in an IPython notebook right now um, using Jupyter Notebook. Uh, you can use any IDE you want. You just need Python. And you'll also need a couple of libraries. So just starting out, uh, getting our imports in here. We need NumPy, which is a library for uh, math and stuff. We'll be using it for matrices and arrays and whatnot. Uh, then what we need is matplotlib, just for plotting our data and visualizing it. And we need sklearn, which is a machine learning library. And I know I said we're not using any libraries. All I'm using sklearn for is actually getting our data. So if you don't have any of these, if you just go right here, you can probably pip, as long as you have Python installed and pip in your uh, system environment, system variables, you can just do pip install and then the name of whatever you're, you are installing. So maybe pip install numpy, NumPy or something like that. Um, I'm using Anaconda, which comes with all of this and a lot more cool stuff. Uh, if you want Anaconda, you can just search up Anaconda. It should be the first thing. Here it is. You can get it right here. So just starting off, what we're going to do is we are going to actually seed our data, right? Uh, seed our randomness. When we generate our weights later on, those will be initially randomized and just so it's the same throughout all our tests or you guys following along with me, uh, I'm just going to see this. So then what we need to do is I'm just going to start off by defining some functions, right? So one thing I mentioned earlier in the last video is that we need an activation function and the activation function we're going to be using is sigmoid, right? So if I, right now I can get a sigmoid function, I'm just going to make it so find sigmoid, um, and this is what it is, right? It's 1 divided by 1 plus e to the negative whatever we are tossing in there. And then another thing I'm going to define right now, just for later we'll need it when we are doing our backpropagation, is I'm going to need a function that calculates sigmoid prime. So if we want, just so we can kind of visualize these, uh, we have matplotlib, so we can do that. Uh, we can, if I run this, kind of see the blue one right here is the sigmoid function, and the orange one is sigmoid prime. So these will be helpful later, and I'll show you when we actually start using them. So the next thing we want to do is we actually want to load in our iris data. So we're using the iris data set, right, which is a set of flowers. It has four attributes, right? Um, petal length, petal width, uh, sepal length, and sepal width. And then the output or the label it provides us is either zero, one, or two. Each one of those is a different type of flower. So first we will get the data just like this. So we're loading the data set from the sklearn data sets. Then we are taking our training data by taking just the just the input or the x and we're putting that into a numpy array uh, there's 150 samples and each of those samples has those four attributes hence why we're shaping it like this the next thing we want to do is get the output of the labels the y and that will also have 150 labels right we want one label for every four attributes however uh, as you might have noticed I don't actually, I call this pre iris y and I make an iris y here that's all zeros. And the reason we want to do this is that we want our data to be one hot. And what I mean by this is if let's say our flowers are two and then we have a one and then we have a zero and then we have a one, right? So if these are just four labels, our first type of flower is two, then one, then zero, then one, we want it in this format, right? Zero, zero, one, and then we would want zero, one, zero, uh, two, 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 
one zero zero and zero one zero. So the reason we kind of want it in this format is it's a lot easier for a neural network to understand this, or rather it makes the data processing work better. It'll be it'll it'll be more accurate and faster and easier for it if the data is in this format. And for the same reason, when we get to actually constructing our model, what we'll have is we'll have a model that has three outputs instead of just one. So to actually get it in this format, we'll just loop through our, our Y data and change these zeros to ones where they need to be. Awesome. So once we have that, we can kind of plot this data out and kind of see what it looks like. So to do that, we just do nice plt.plot the iris x against the iris y on the iris y. Um, so what we'll see right here is uh, you can kind of already see a trend just looking at the data, right? So this first line, this purple one right here is our first type of flower. Uh, and then we'll see the green, orange, uh, blue, and red, which are all different types of attributes, right? So one of those is sepal length, sepal width, and then petal length and petal width. And you can actually see that they really already, just looking at this, we can see that they correspond fairly fairly easily, it's fairly clear. So the brown is the type one flower and the pink is the type two flower. And you can see how the from the blue, green and red, it's super easy to tell the orange is a little bit harder. I'm not actually sure if there is correlation there. Uh, I haven't looked into it that much, but just looking at this, we could probably predict. Of course, the point is having a computer do it. So when we have a lot of data or more complex data, we don't have to do this kind of thing by hand. So what we want to do next is we want to shuffle up our data, right? And the reason we want to shuffle up our data is we don't want our network to get used to seeing things in a certain format, or not a certain format, but a certain way. We don't want it to be in order like this, or else it will train on 50 of these, 50 of these, and then 50 of these all in order, which could end up giving it an unwanted sort of unwanted weights or gradient. So we're going to do this really quick, and this will just randomize it not ran and it will keep it will make sure that the input x stays with its respected input y that way we don't have to worry about it just completely being randomized and messed up so now if we actually plot this we'll see that it is totally randomized now you can see that where the blue goes up the green also goes up just as in here so that's a pretty good indication that it all stayed together. So that is good. And the next thing we're going to want to do is we are going to want to write out some variables. And these variables we're going to start out with will primarily be the variables for the structure of our model. So first we'll want how many, the number of input nodes, the number of nodes in our input layer. So in in equals four. We'll have four input nodes because we have four attributes, right? Then we'll want our hidden layer. We're just going to use 10. You can try other things. Uh, I actually really encourage you to try different amounts of different numbers for the number of hidden nodes. It actually affects your program quite a bit. And then we'll have three output layers, out, not output layers, output nodes, because output nodes, we have the class for zero, class for one and the class for two. Another thing I didn't mention earlier, what's nice about having it in the one hop format is that not only is it just zero, one or two, you can have some percentage that maybe the probability that it's zero, the probability that it's one and the probability that it's two. For example, you might have 0 0.1, 0 0.8 and 0 0.3. And from this, we could be pretty sure that it's a type one flower. Although we can also see that it's more, it more resembles a type two than a type zero. In some cases you might want that. In some cases you might not, it just kind of depends. So the next things we'll want to define right here are the alpha. So we're, I'm going to set our alpha to 0 0.1. Um, and what the alpha actually is, is sorry, the alpha tells us how much we change the weights if we want to change them a lot, our alpha is going to be higher. If we want to change them a little bit, our alpha is going to be smaller. 0.1 is pretty high for most things. 
normally you'd probably be using like 0 0.001 or 0 0.01 is what you'll see with most models. But in this case, because we're it's a very simple network, 0 0.1 works just fine. And then we're going to have in epics. And an epic is essentially just one, we're going to do 500. An epic is one run through of all the data. So when we're actually training our model, and by training, I mean actually doing forward propagation, multiplying all of our nodes through to the end, getting the error, then back propagating and adjusting our weights. That's one training cycle. So one epic is a training cycle for every, every point in your data. So that would be 150 training sort of from beginning to end updating your weights. We'll do 500 of those. Awesome. So that's kind of the variables we want there. The next thing we'll want to define is the actual feed forward of the network. Okay, so let's draw this out really quick so we can kind of see what we're doing before we get right into the code. So we're going to have four input neurons, 10 hidden neurons, and three output neurons in our actual code. So we can kind of sketch that out real quick. I'm not going to draw all the synapses because that's way too many and same for the hidden nodes and then we need to remember we also have an activation in each hidden and output node so i'll denote the input nodes as in one through four the hidden as in one not sorry as h one through ten and the out as o one through three so when i'm drawing them out that's what they mean now four and ten nodes is quite a bit to have, so instead we're going to go with 2 and 4, really just replacing that 10 with a 2, which will make drawing all this out with the weights much, much easier. This, how, this isn't how it will be in the actual code, but just as an example, this is what I'm going to go with. So drawing out the actual weights, I'm going to draw them as matrices, and I'll explain why in a second, but this is how it's usually done with actual neural networks. So the dimensions of these matrices is going to be uh, if we're going from input to hidden layers, it's going to be two rows and four columns. So the input by the output. I know I make a mistake in drawing the input weights here, but I will get to correcting that, so don't worry about it right now. And then the for the second one, it's going from hidden to out, that will be four by three columns. Sorry, rows by columns. And whenever I talk about matrices from now on, I always, when I'm talking about dimensions, I always mean rows and then columns. Cool. And w, it will be W1 or 2 based on which major weight set it's from. And then the number after that will be its index in that set of weights. So why do we use matrices? And the reason for that is if we actually take it your GPU that uh, is in your computer, is that your GPU can do matrix calculations really, 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 really fast. And the reason for that is that all games and like the reason you want a good GPU to render stuff quickly is because rendering stuff is just matrix calculations. It's so many and that's what a GPU is optimized for. So if we can actually do our neural network and with these matrices, we can get a huge speed up really, really big. And I'm not talking about like five times. I'm talking about like 10 times, 20 times, 50 times. It's insane. So we won't actually be coding that because it's a bit difficult without a library. But once we get to TensorFlow, we'll be doing that. And right here, let's correct that first weight error. I, know I did the columns by the rows instead of the rows by the columns. So my mistake. <laughs> so now what we'll do is we'll actually multiply through just like we would in a neural network and kind of see how this matrix multiplication works and then I'll draw out the actual network and show you how it kind of corresponds to what we were doing in the last tutorial. So also, if you haven't seen the last video, definitely go check that out because we go into we go into this kind of the overview of what we're doing here. So when we multiply n1 and n2 by these weights, we take n1 and n2 and multiply that, as you see, by w11 and w15 and add those up to get our result for the first part. And if you don't know how to do matrix multiplication, I would recommend and just looking up. It's pretty simple, but I'm just not going to go over it super in depth now. 
it's a pretty simple pattern if you can see it. So yeah, so now let's actually draw out the network and see how this actually what this actually looks like when we're drawing the whole thing out because it's really confusing to look at I think just the matrix but once you see how they work together or not how they work together but how one is the same as the other it it's not very difficult so here we see just like we got h1 in our matrix representation we can also get h1 here um, just by drawing it out and multiplying the input by their following synapses that lead up to h1 so if you actually look we got the same result by using a network and doing it one by one as we did by doing it with a matrix a matrix is just faster in a more compact way of writing it all out and then the last thing we need to go over is the activation function or in our case the sigmoid function and when i use sigmoid on a maybe the entire input layer that just means that i'm doing it on each individual node so just in case that was a little confusing that's applied to each one awesome so now let's get back to the code and write all this out what we want to do is we will define an in in forward so this will be forward propagation and forward propagation is actually taking our data and multiplying it through our network to get an answer so what we want is one input a first set of weights and a second set of weights. We're going to have one hidden layer in this neural network, which means we have need two sets of weights between our input and hidden layer and our hidden layer and output layer. Awesome. So then what we'll do is we're going to reshape our input just to make sure that it's in the right shape. So reshape, and we want negative one, one negative one by four. Negative one means that the shape doesn't matter. And four means that there's four, obviously. So if we have maybe we're using five examples at a time, this would be five by four. Five sorts of sets of data, sets of points, and each one of those has four attributes for our input attributes. Awesome. The next thing we want to do is we want to multiply this by our weights to get our second layer. So we'll say layer two equals np dot dot, and dot is for matrix well, either the dot product or it also works like matrix multiplication. And we'll dot our input with our first set of weights. Awesome. So now what we have is we have the weights in the hidden layer, first hidden layer. And then what we need to do is we need to apply the activation function or our sigma function that we made earlier right up. Where is it? Right up here. And remember, this is for making sure that we don't necessarily have to have something that's a linear transformation. So we're going to sigmoid our second layer. Cool. So then what we want to do is we want to multiply those through to the output layer. So we'll say out for the output layer equals multiply matrix multiplication again, layer two, comma, by our second weight. So now we're multiplying our hidden layer by its set of weights. And finally, we'll finish that up by doing a nice sigmoid out and return out. Honestly, I probably don't need a sigmoid in this last layer. That's something you can try to do with or without. And usually you do a soft max really, which we'll talk about it another time, but it works. It works. Keeping it simple for now. Awesome. So for now, we'll leave it there with forward propagation. That's half the battle, probably the simpler half, but I'll have another tutorial soon on how to train the actual network and test its accuracy and whatnot. So stick around for that. I should have, once it's out, a link in the description, which should be very soon. Thank you very much, and see you guys later.